Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Lisa McShane and uh, I'll be helping uh, kick us off here today. Um, uh, really glad you're all here. Um, so we've um, structured this to be a conversation uh, amongst, um, amongst folks. Just hold on one sec, unpin myself, there we are. Okay, so if we can have all of the panelists um, welcome and uh, go ahead and turn on your cameras. Ah, you're all here, thank you, that's wonderful. Uh, and just check your name real quick. And if it's not your name, uh, feel free to rename yourself. So this is the first um, webinar. Uh, it's a moderated conversation. Uh, first in a series of uh, Snake River dinner hour um, webinars that we're going to be doing. And it's really a you know, dinner time conversation among uh, folks who are exceptionally well informed on, on these issues. Um, Today's topic is honoring tribal treaty rights and saving our fishing industries. Um, we're going to have future conversations focused on energy, irrigation, transportation, and you can sign up for those webinars at snakeriverdinnerhour.com. Dinner, uh, towards the end of the evening, we're going to have a dispatch from DC. Uh, David Dreyer, a senior policy manager at the National Wildlife Federation. Welcome, David. It's really nice to, uh, to meet you. Uh, he'll share some updates on policies coming out of DC. Uh, and we'll have a call to action by Abby Abramovich. Uh, she's with the Idaho Conservation League, uh, where she is the Salmon Campaign Grassroots Coordinator. And uh, we're honored to have Alyssa Macy as our moderator today. Alyssa is the CEO of the Washington Environmental Council and Washington Conservation Voters. Alyssa joined WEC from the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs of Oregon, where she served as the Chief Operations Officer for the tribal government. Alyssa brings a strong background in political action, social justice, and tribal leadership, grounded in a deep personal collection to our land, water, and the communities they sustain. And uh, Alyssa, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce um, uh, the folks for this evening. Thank you so much for that introduction and welcome everybody to the first webinar in the Snake River Dinner Hour Series. We're really glad that you're here and we're looking forward to the topic tonight on how we honor tribal treaty rights and save our fishing industry. I'm gonna introduce our experts this evening. I'll start out with Tim Ballou, the second. Uh, Tim is a commercial fisherman and the CEO of the Lummi Commercial Company. Tim lives on the Lummi Reservation with his wife, Leanne, and has two sons, Hunter and Tandy, where he was introduced um, to the fishing traditions from his father, uncle, and grandfather. Tim formerly served as a chairman of the Lummi Nation, which is home to the country's largest native commercial fishing fleet. We are also joined this evening by Liz Hamilton. Liz Hamilton is the executive director for the Northwest Sports Fishing Industry Association, an, organized, an organization she helped found in 1993. The association is dedicated to the preservation, restoration, and enhancement of sport fisheries and the businesses dependent upon them. Liz lives on a small farm in Oregon City with her husband, Art, a fisheries biologist, their Labrador, Kangal livestock, guardian dogs, sheep, and chickens. Fishing, hunting, and tending their large garden and animal feeds her soul and fills their pantry. I want to come visit you, Liz. <laughs> Dr. Helen Neville is a senior scientist for Trout Unlimited. Based in Boise, Idaho, she provides science oversight and guidance to the organization nationally, but because of her past research and interest in conveying the science behind the need, she lends particular focus to the opportunity to restore the Snake River migratory corridor and ecosystem. Welcome to all of the panelists this evening. Wanted to go ahead and get started um, and ask a question. And I'm gonna ask Tim, uh, you to take this question to start us out tonight. What is the importance of Snake River salmon to the treaty rights of tribal nations in the Pacific Northwest? I uh, think, thank you, Alyssa, for the question. And um, 
thank you to everyone for taking some time out uh, to share this evening. I think that I'm going to, um, well, I answer the question. I think I'm going to share a slideshow that I just put together. So bear with me. Uh, the importance uh, to salmon generally to the native people of the coast uh, Salish Sea means uh, it, it, it's a, that, that's a hard question for me to answer uh, because it really binds and ties together the culture and way of life of the Lummi people and so many of the other treaty tribes of the Pacific Northwest. The act of harvesting fish, salmon, um, and not just salmon, but any, any sort of fin fish or shellfish, it is the root of the way of life for the native fishing people of the Pacific Northwest. And it's much more than just a harvest uh, of the, the fish or the shellfish. The preparation and time it takes to get ready uh, for a harvest, uh, the coming back home and sharing of the resources with your family, uh, with your children, your grandparents, and all of the um, all of the teachings and stories that are passed down to you from whoever your teacher is, that is uh, the most important thing about fishing, regardless of its commercial fishing, uh, recreational or you know native subsistence fishing. The way of life of uh, that that's passed down through the processes is. Um, that's what matters to me the most. I think that's what drove me to public service, uh, making sure that my uh, children get the same opportunities that I did. And without good fish habitat, without good water quality, and all the things that puts in to, uh, that's required to manage a fishery, a, a sustainable fishery, you know, that's the importance of salmon uh, to the native people of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, without, those, without the salmon, there's going to be no opportunities to bring the resource home, uh, have fish barbecues, and uh, put fish away for the rest of the year, and to teach our children um, you know, the importance of that, because it really it's, it's uh, what feeds our soul. And um, I, I know that that's not like the technical answer, but that's the human answer. I mean, that's the the real reason that I think that those are those of us that are involved in uh, protecting salmon is really uh, protecting a way of life and a way of life that is balanced uh, with with the environment and also uh, the agreements that were made between the Native people and uh, the United States of America. I mean, there was a agreement made to put down our arms and uh, find a way to live together as a community, and we've been doing that uh, at least in the Pacific Northwest since 1855. And um, I, I really think it's our responsibility to make sure that the environment, the fishing resources, and the communities have, have a chance to succeed in the future. Um, again, uh, you know, thank you for the opportunity. I think it's a great question and uh, appreciative for everyone uh, taking some time out this evening. Uh, to, to talk about this important issue. Thank you, Tim. And thank you for speaking to the, the heart of the issue from your heart center. I think sometimes we get caught up in the science of, of salmon and we don't talk about the spiritual and the cultural piece of this. And it's so important, especially as indigenous peoples. Um, I have a question for you, Liz. And, and I know you think about salmon all the time. I ask this question to a lot of folks and to elders and folks I'm crossing paths with in work. And the question is, what would the Northwest be without salmon and without the harvestable levels of salmon? Who would we be? Can we stop extinction? And if so, how? Well, you know, a former governor defined the Northwest as any place the salmon can get to. And if we don't do our work to, re to restore salmon, it, it's going to be a shrinking place. Um, I, you, you can't go anywhere in the Northwest without seeing a salmon, an image. Uh, it's just so ingrained in who we are for our culture, for our hearts, for our families. Um, I too, my, my earliest memory is going out in my grandfather's boat and now we take our grandchildren out in our boat. It is, 
it is a part of a family that you don't marry into unless you're willing to go out and, and share this culture with us. Um, but it, it defines us economically, it defines the health of our environment, and it defines the health of our spirits. So um, I, I, I don't know, what would we be? I, I, can't, I can't imagine, because I don't know that we would be. I find that question when I ask that to myself, a, a question that is unimaginable. Mm -hmm. um, for, for those of us in the Pacific Northwest and across the across this whole region, salmon is a, a part of so many different cultures. And um, when I think about the possibility and, and of extinction, I, I can't imagine what it would be like. Um, and it also uh, pushes us with the work to do this work with the with the urgency and, and the need to meet the time that we're in. Um, Dr. Neville, you, you spend a lot of time also thinking about fish and there's lots of different type of salmon. Can you tell us why we should be concerned about this population of salmon, the Columbia River salmon? Well, I think we are at a, a really pivotal moment in time um, where we really risk losing this incredible being in our world, you know, um, the salmon, as everyone has said here, are just such important threads to the culture, the livelihood, the sustenance of, of everyone here as people. Um, and, and they are really at risk. Um, recently in the, the Snake River, for instance, the Nez Perce tribe just put out a report this past summer showing that about 40% of our Snake River populations have reached a quasi extinction threshold, which is basically a level low enough to demonstrate that they're extremely at risk. And we have a hard time even sort of modeling and projecting how these populations may uh, go in the future. And they're predicting that those numbers might increase to about 70% of our populations in, in just uh, by 2025. So we are really at a grave turning point here, um, which I think presents the opportunity and the choice we have in front of us that we have an opportunity to turn this around. We know what the need is. The science all fundamentally points in the same direction. Um, there is terribly strong support for restoring the migratory corridor here. And I think we're really at a, at a crossroads where we have a choice to make, um, posing the very question you just posed, what will we be without salmon in this region? Because that's what we're, we're facing if we don't make this choice. So I would say, you know, not act not acting is always an action and in this case we have a choice put in front of us either to act and to to step up and make a decision here to to prevent these extinctions or we're making a choice um, to to let this go thank you I, I love how you you frame this as a choice because inaction is also a choice and i think one of the important things to remember is that um, our actions add up, and it's the sum of those actions that can really create change. And I think that's important to note because we can all play a role in taking action to um, remove the Snake River dams, to address the issue in front of us, and to ensure that salmon have a future here in the Pacific Northwest, and we can do all the things like go fishing and enjoy, enjoy eating them. I actually have a, a question for you, um, Tim. Tell us what is your favorite way to prepare salmon? And we would love to hear about salmon and how you prepare it and what it means to you as a food source. Oh, my, um, oh, my favorite way, probably the way that we eat it the most is um, fish hash. Um, so canned salmon cooked with uh, cooked with potatoes. I've never heard it, but I gotta believe that that's actually probably a um, uh, you know Great Depression staple that kind of survived and uh, is still prepared on a regular basis. A lot less uh, since uh, sockeye uh, sockeye uh, sockeye canned salmon is probably my favorite uh, salmon to prepare. Uh, that's a close tie with uh, barbecued king salmon. And that is uh, a practice that was taught to my dad from my mom's father. I'm a grandpa Claude from Swinomish. And um, I, I get the privilege of um, 
learning how to do that from my dad and my uncle John. And uh, yeah, I, I think it, nothing compares to it. And unfortunately, uh, there's just a lot less opportunity uh, to cook fish and cook in that way of barbecuing it, uh, which is a, a little scary because that gives that what that means is less opportunity uh, to teach our our children. And um, but we, we still find the chances and opportunities. And um, yeah, yeah, I, I think that a tie between fish hash and uh, bar barbecued king salmon. Thank you. I'll, I'll be asking for the specific recipe later, but I do love canned salmon on hardtack. Um, if folks know what hardtack is, my my uh, father's store used to sell it all the time. Sailor Boy hardtack, and I do like to put fish and cheese spread on that and eat it. It's one of my favorite things. Um, I have a question for you, Liz. Um, when we hear about industry and conversations about dam removal, and certainly we're hearing a lot of that now. Um, we usually hear just about agriculture. What are your thoughts about it? Is fishing part of our economy? And could you walk us through why this conversation needs to be expanded to include recreational fishing and tourism industries? Yeah, I appreciate that question. Um, because I, I often think this whole, this whole discussion is set up as a false choice, right? It's salmon versus farming or salmon versus energy. And though you're, you're gonna show this in the, later, in the later dinners, which I will attend all of them, but the, the, those are false choices. And when we talk about industry, the, the fact that there is a sport fishing industry has been left out of the discussion. In Oregon and Washington and Idaho, there are 2 million people who fish, 2 million people who take this amazing creature home to their families and share it with their friends and, and eat that. And those are the customers that sustain over 36,000 jobs in the Pacific Northwest. And so it's a large industry. We generate about 5 billion in economic output. And you know, in, on the federal government side, they've done a really good job of ignoring the size of the existing industry. And they've done a very good job of ignoring what it means for sport and commercial and tribal fishers with recovery. But these are the figures without recovery. Imagine where we would go if we could restore the river and its bounty. Thank you. You know, I think about my community of Warm Springs and the fact that there are people there that fish for a living and the opportunity to have a livable um, wage from that to, 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 to earn enough dollars to take care of your family is becoming more and more difficult. And, you know, if, if, this, if the salmon runs recovered, people would be able to have a better life. And you know, we were people of the river. We still are people of the river. It's changed with reservations and removal, but we go back there because that's who we are. And I think the ability to kind of reconnect and have an opportunity um, as tribal folks to make a living from fishing and also for people who are taking folks out to, you know, to go fly fishing and do that as well. Like it's an opportunity for you to see um, the river and nature in all of its beauty. And it really is an amazing thing to do, to be present in that space. And, and so, yes, a lot of dollars and a lot of jobs for this region. And I I, I'm catching the, the things in the chat about everybody's food. And I, <laughs> <laughs> well, it also just connects families in the mm -hmm. way that Tim showed, you know, on the sport fishing side as, as well, the, the electronics are gone. You're out enjoying nature together. And it's also a, a, one of the best transfers of wealth from urban communities to rural communities where the fish are. And so, um, you know, it, it is a big economic engine for the Pacific Northwest. It is. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I have a question for you, Dr. Neville. Um, there are so many things that we talk about when it comes to salmon recovery and the snake. And, um, but please tell us, what do you think is the most important thing that we can do to restore Snake River salmon to harvestable levels? 
and why does it matter? Great question. Um, well, it matters for all the reasons that were just put before us in terms of the community and um, how many people rely on these ecosystems and the fisheries they provide. Um, I think, you know, again, there are lots of impacts, obviously, on our Pacific salmon, but it is very clear that one of the biggest limiting factors up here in the snake system is the lack of ability for the fish to make it through the hydro system and survive that impact and then return back up to the snake river system. So um, again, I think the, the real volume of science points in the direction of the need to restore the migratory corridor. We have tried really everything else, right? For decades and decades, billions of dollars. Um, we have tried restoring habitat and the, the most recent science is demonstrating very clearly that the gains in habitat restoration can only be realized if we allow the fish to return to utilize the habitat, right? It is truly um, restoring the returns of these fish back to the habitat that will enable them to rebuild these systems. The fish up here in the habitat that they live in um, collectively create some of the, the highest productivity for Chinook salmon, for instance, that's ever been recorded in the Middle Fork Salmon River. These fish have an amazing ability to produce fish to produce offspring and to produce fish that can come back and reseed and rebuild. Um, and once we get those nutrients back in, I heard David Montgomery speaking in the earlier film that you were all playing, you know, this is, it's really a broken ecos ecosystem in a lot of ways right now where we've lost that nutrient input. And so there are these, a lot of cascading effects that will all operate together. Um, the amazing ability of these fish to respond to their habitats, to weather, different impacts and um, use their life history diversity and all of the amazing resilience they have built in from a biological perspective, they respond really readily to opportunity when it's presented to them. But right now we, we know that that lifeblood of the ability to rebuild these systems has just simply been cut off by the impacts of these dams. So I think that's that is the immediate, um, you know, most most effective action that we have before us today. In concert with all of these other needs, right? Like all, all of the other work that's being done, the fisheries management, the habitat work, it's all very important. Mm -hmm. But the best opportunity we have to realize the effects of the, the, the benefits of all of that collective work is to, to restore the migratory corridor and allow the fish to return successfully. Yeah. Thank you. Your answer made me think of just how everything is connected. You know, as we pull here, we see something happen over here and it's it's the sum of all these actions. It, it's not just one thing. Um, there's one big thing, but we have to do everything else as well. And it, it kind of brings me back to what we were saying earlier about, you know, the ability to take action. Sometimes this might feel really big, and um, sort of daunting to make the change, but you can make the change and you can all play a role. We can all play a role in ensuring that salmon have a future. Doesn't have to be, we don't have to be a scientist. We don't have to be a policymaker. There are things that we can do as an advocate um, and as a community member to make sure that salmon um, will be here in the future. You know, I live um, in Bellingham, and so I live close to water, and, I, and I've heard often from folks as an argument that it's ocean conditions are the real problem for salmon populations. And Tim, you are also in this area, and I know you think about this a lot as a fisherman and as running um, LCC. Can you tell us, is that true? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And then I have a follow-up question about that. Well, my apologies. I just fi figured out how to respond to questions that are popping up. I didn't hear the question. I was, being, I was, I was attempting to type a response to something. Yeah, else. no worries. I was just saying that, you know, I, I, I live here in Bellingham yeah. and, and I'm so near the water and I hear a lot of folks saying, you know, the, the real problem here are the ocean conditions. Um, that's the real problem for salmon populations. And from your perspective, is that true? It's no, it's not a, it's not a, um, it's, it's a complex problem with not just one solution. Uh, you know, in general, you know, fish habitat, water quality, um, good, good regulation of, of fishing. 
there's a lot of different things that uh, that result in the amount of fish that there is and also the amount of fish that's harvestable to keep it sustainable. So it's not just uh, you know the ocean conditions alone. Um, you have to look at the whole life cycle of the salmon. Um, they you know they're, they're they're spawned in the in the river. Uh, they leave they uh, leave you know, on average for four or so years, go back home, and the cycle begins again. And the entire ecosystem and environment and how we respect the fish as they travel to and from home, that's what uh, we, we need to hone in on. And where there, well, we need to help and the things that we can help with, you know, if that's you know, upriver, the environment or habitat upriver, um, we, need to, we all need to play our part uh, to make sure that, that the salmon are there for the future. Yeah, thank you. Um, I know that for the Lummi people, um, salmon also are very important and are related to the orca. Can you talk a little bit about that relation as well? Because that is a, a very culturally important piece to your community. And I think when we talk about the full environmental piece, the, the, the being able to go home and come back, um, that is a part of that cycle. Can you just share a little bit about what that means to you? Yeah, the um, well, I, I think not specifically about the orca, but the um, the overall. Uh, I guess the best way I can explain it, the way it was taught to me, is that you know if everything's working well, there is actually a calendar or a native calendar that's different than you know the January through through December, but like a seasonal um, uh, calendar that like for, for example, we're coming up to March. Uh, so the time that the dandelion comes out is right around the same time that crab molt, halibut around here show up. And, um, and there, there's certain things like that. And those were some of the decision points or regulatory uh, indicators for, for tribal people of you know what's in season and when it's safe and when, when harvesting can begin. And when some of those things uh, tend to uh, skew or uh, when things don't show up, when the uh, ecosystem shows a little bit of an imbalance, um, that's when it's time to start asking, you know, what, what needs to be done differently? What are we doing that we could do differently? Um, because it's, it's uh, and I was cliche to say it, but it, it really shows that you know, everything is connected in some way. And it's not just, uh, for an issue as complex as this, it's, it's not just one thing that's gonna solve the problem. And um, it's something that we can all come together, you know, if in the technical community, the science, uh, in, in the policy community, to figure out a way uh, to, to tackle an issue and solve something that uh, we probably only have uh, the rest of our lifetime to do it. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate um, hearing your thoughts about that. We hear that 95% of salmon make it past each dam. Liz, is that true? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh. <laughs> well, you know, dam passage for smolts is about 95% at each facility but that ignores some huge, huge pieces of the puzzle. First of all, it ignores those that are lost to predation in the lakes that were described in the video. Those, are, those, are, those reservoirs are just dead water for the fish. It doesn't cover the fact that the next dam is 95% of 95% and the next one is 95% of that. So it's diminishing each time how many fish survive and then none of it takes into account the delayed mortality. We have stressed them so much in getting through all those eight federal dams, those enormous reservoirs and predators. By the time they get to the ocean, their fitness in the first year of survival is tremendously diminished. So that figure is rather false, I'm sorry. I, it's, it's a disingenuous figure and I resent hearing it. So I, I, I'm trying to behave myself. <laughs> 
Could I add a little a little bit more on that great answer sure. that, that Liz gave? Um, that figure is generally capturing basically passing a fish from the top of the concrete to the bottom of the concrete. It's an, a measurement of compliance at each dam. So it literally takes a very small slice of what they're uh, of what they're enduring as they pass over the dam. But as Liz said, it in no way looks at the cumulative impacts across all the dams, across traveling those reservoirs where they historically used to go tail first toward the ocean. Now they have to act actively swim. Mm -hmm. uh, the cumulative time now is often about 10 times longer for them to get to the ocean. So that's 10 times the amount of energy they're spending without food in those hot reservoirs, which increases their metabolism massive amounts of predation, as Liz noted, and then the delayed mortality. So um, if you add up all of those cumulative impacts, the recent science up here in Idaho is estimating about 20 to 25% mortality per dam. And again, that's 20 to 25% at dam one, another 20 to 25% at dam two, the whole way through. So um, just add a little bit more detail on Liz's great answer there. I yeah. heard it once described by a biologist that concrete to concrete snapshot is like someone jumped off a building and they passed your window and you went, yep, they're still good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's really interesting because when you hear these things, um, statements like that shared and you don't have the bigger context, I think it's easy to say, well, 95%, everything's fine. Um, but you're right, there's eight frontal dams that you have to, you're swimming, you're literally swimming against water, you're going through these reservoirs of water, um, the amount of stress that fish are experiencing in that time is substantial, and as the impacts of climate change continue to increase, it's going to become harder and harder, and, and it's happening, we see it, I know last year there was some footage that was shared of salmon in the Columbia River that looked like they were burned. Um, they were still alive, but their scales and skin was falling off. It was, it, when I saw that, I cried. I literally cried to see that because it just hurt so much to know that this resource, this precious resource that my community, my people, and other people of the Columbia River have made a commitment to always take care of, that that was the state that we were in. That's the state that our relative is in. And it was a really difficult thing to see and to witness. And you don't, we don't just witness it, right? Because we're not in the water looking, but we, we had footage and, and it was a stark reality for me to see that. And I know for the community and for folks that care about salmon, um, I think all of us were really shocked to, to see that. Um, one more question. Uh, salmon are under stress from a changing climate, such as higher water temperatures, drought and flooding. Would removing dams help to mitigate those impacts? And I'm looking at you, Dr. Neville. Yes, absolutely. Um, and getting back to the ocean question again, the, the best thing we can do for these salmon is enable them to, to rebuild their own resilience and they have all of these amazing life history strategies that they have developed over thousands and thousands and thousands of years here to deal with fires and floods and drought and warm temperatures because they are as Dave as Tim said they have different cohorts of fish different ages going out at different times and returning at different times at age two at age three at age four so there are always different components of a population spread out through the entire ecosystem of salmon. And that gives them a tremendous buffering ability to deal with change and impacts. Um, so yes, restoring their ability to, to return and spawn and be productive and increase their abundance will be a tremendous um, benefit to their ability to deal with climate change. And then I think it's really important to emphasize that the snake offers truly west wide in the lower 48, the last best, coldest habitat for salmon and steelhead. It, it currently represents about 20% of the accessible habitat to, to Pacific salmon westwide in the lower 48, but about 50% of the current cold water available to them. And in the future, that will be about 65% of the cold water westwide. So this truly is the bullseye for restoring access to one of the most resilient 
um, large landscapes they have available and much of it is protected in wilderness quality protection, right? Like the Middle Fork Salmon River. Um, so, it, so it's our best shot at, at, at maintaining salmon, you know, overall. Thank you so much. I really appreciate um, all of your insight to these questions. I know there are so much more things that we can talk about. And I believe we are now going to move into a dispatch from DC. And I am thinking, there you go, there's Lisa. Hi, David, welcome back. Did you, there you are. <laughs> Uh, a couple of questions came in uh, that we thought we'd hold for you. Um, um, but uh, first, uh, go ahead and give us your dispatch from DC and then uh, I'll ask you a couple of questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, and I wanna thank Alyssa for such a wonderful moderation of, of this evening and thanks for everyone for joining. Um, just a, a quick word about uh, my history after 20 years in, in working on natural resources policy in DC uh, with the Northwest delegation. Uh, I split my time now uh, in Montana, but I grew up in Oregon and my father was a commercial fisherman. I had a fishing, I had a commercial fishing license when I was seven. He used to tell me stories about Salila Falls. Uh, so uh, long history in the Northwest and particularly with salmon. So I appreciate this discussion a lot. Um, as you may know, there's a lot going on in DC uh, between Russia and Ukraine and a Supreme Court nominee and still discussions happening, thankfully out of the press uh, on Build Back Better, uh, which includes a historic amount of money for uh, forest resilience and fish and watershed restoration. Um, recently, Congress passed the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, uh, which had a number of watershed enhancement measures in it. Most notably, I think for salmon, the billions of dollars for, um, for fish passage, culvert repair, replacement, um, which is really important. But of course, it's not enough. That doesn't, if anyone thinks that, that they've done that and it solves our problem, uh, they're wrong. So we're, we're continuing to work in DC to make sure that we, we do the things that are necessary to recover um, the salmon that, that we want to recover. And so really what's happened, and I have to say, uh, I've worked on this issue, Liz could tell you, we've met more than 20 years ago. Um, I've worked on this issue in Washington, D.C. for a long time, and there has never been this level of interest and engagement um, from people that have, have not supported dam removal in the past. Uh, and there is more momentum now than I've seen in, uh, in three decades. Uh, so that's really encouraging. Uh, the conversation right now is primarily around the Water Resources Development Act. The Senate and House are working to produce their own versions of that legislation. It's usually a bipartisan bill um, that comes through the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee in the House and uh, the, the Commerce Committee in the Senate. It's, uh, it, there's the process that has been set up by Senator Murray and Governor Inslee to see if they can replace the services that the dams provide. And if that's possible, then we can work toward removal. And in that vein, to a, a vehicle to test that perhaps um, is WERDA, the shorthand for the Water Resources Development Act. Um, and I think what we want to see, or excuse me, what Senator Murray is pushing in that, and it does have support um, in the House and Senate, is to take a large look at the system. Um, the Corps of Engineers is, is responsible for just a 
a small part of the system, but this may be a vehicle for us to look at the system uh, in its entirety and produce a plan that actually leads to dam removal and recovery of salmon. So that's what Congress is, is working on at the moment. I think that we're going to see, uh, we, we should see those bills come together in the spring. Um, typically each, each chamber would pass their own bill and they would go to a conference committee. It's one of the few things that Congress actually does a conference committee on anymore. Um, it would go to a conference committee in about July, uh, and over the summer they would work out the differences and then pass the bill. Uh, Congress isn't that functional or easy anymore, so I'm not sure that we're going to maintain a historic timeline for uh, a word of bill, but Congress is going to try, and that's really where the conversation in D.C. around uh, Columbia River Basin salmon is going to take place. One other thing, the, the administration um, is, is working cross agency on this issue. There have been a lot of briefings. They really are engaged more than it may seem. Um, there's still a long way to go there, uh, but there's a lot, a lot more engagement than we've ever seen at the administrative level as well. Great, thanks, David. Um, somebody asked in the chat if um, if there's a specific bill number uh, we could share. Also, can you define uh, WERDA? Yeah, so the Water Resources Development Act uh, identifies it. It establishes some policy, and every it it gets authorized every three to five years. Every time. Uh, Congress says we're not going to do policy. This is just going to be a projects bill, and that's never true. Uh, so they address um, water resources policy issues um, as well as identify projects. Um, uh, there's a whole host of municipal water projects, federal water projects, and all of those things get authorized and um, and and money gets spent on those on those projects through, uh, you know, like I said, every five year reauthorization of the word of bill. Great, thanks, really appreciate it. I think, you know, folks were, are curious about a bill number because they're also curious what individuals can do to influence the process in DC. How can people, I think Abby's gonna get us some actions, um, but really specific to DC, um, what can people do? I think, uh, all of the NGO organizations uh, submit um, letters to the to the committees to say, here's what we would like to see as part of this legislation. Um, individuals can do that as well. Uh, I think, and especially in the Northwest where this is a politically difficult issue. Uh, I know everyone, everyone here is on the same page and thinks that it shouldn't be a politically difficult issue, but it is. So uh, from, from Senator Wyden to Chairman DeFazio to Mr. Kilmer, and in, interestingly enough, uh, Congressman Larson in Washington State is probably going to be the next chair or ranking member because Congressman DeFazio is retiring. Um, Mr. Larson is going to be the next lead Democrat on transportation and infrastructure. So the more these members of Congress hear from people to say, hey, this is an important issue and we need to address it because we've run out of time uh, is, is really important. So write a letter, call your member of Congress, let them know this decision is important to you. Great, thanks, David. I might, um, I think we have time, maybe this will, Maybe this will be brief. <laughs> um, somebody, Gary, uh, was asking um, uh, about BPA and ACOE lobbies working against WERDA and what points of leverage we might have as citizens. That is a great question. I, I, wish, I, I wish I had an answer for it. BPA is a tough one. Uh, the utilities are tough, but their utilities are 
are engaging on this issue and there is interest in um, in seeking solutions. So I think that the largest leverage point on BPA is going to be individual utilities. Um, you can also write letters to your utility, um, whether it's eWeb or uh, Seattle or uh, you know Snohomish. Uh, engage with them uh, anytime there's a, a public meeting. Uh, there's look for places to engage and have your voice be heard. Um, yeah, the the utilities are are an important constituency to the the policymakers that I I described. It's one of the issues that makes it politically difficult. Um, but write a letter to the editor. Um, everything that you can do to put this in front of people, um, you know, folks do still read the paper uh, in some in some places. So uh, it, write a letter to the editor. Show up at a public meeting. Uh, look for for every way that you can just get your voice out there. David, I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate you joining us uh, as our dispatch from DC at the Snake River Dinner Hour. And uh, and now we've got uh, Abby Abramovich um, coming to tell us uh, what, uh, what things you can do. Abby? Yeah, thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you to all our experts who are here tonight. It was so great to hear from all of you. Um, but I especially want to thank those of you who have tuned in for this first webinar tonight. Um, I've seen so many great comments and questions and discussions and recipes in the chat, and it's been really great to see this engagement and this level of excitement around this issue. I am super passionate about this issue, but I also feel incredibly lucky to get to hop in at the most exciting time. I think we've heard from David and Liz and all the others who have been here tonight talk about all the hard work that um, been uh, laid, all the groundwork that's been laid in the past um, to get this issue on folks' radar. And we we're at a really critical time right now where we have elected officials listening and paying attention and wanting to hear from their constituents. Um, so there will be a couple of links coming up in the chat where you can easily contact your elected official. And so the, I believe the first one, um, you'll be able to send an email to your local elected officials asking them to stop salmon extinction to engage in this process that we just heard about from David um, and to restore the Lower Snake River. Additionally, there will be a link from Idaho Conservation League where I really encourage you to take further action. So hopefully you can send that email in just a couple of seconds by adding your information. But in the second link, you'll find information on how to make a phone call to your local elected official. And there'll be a call script there that has information state by state with key talking points but I'd encourage you to add more and share if you're a fisherman, why you care about this issue. If you have family traditions around salmon and steelhead that you're not able to um, do anymore or that you're worried about, I'd, I would definitely encourage you to add a little personal touch and share with your elected official, hey, this is a really important issue. I urge you to take action as soon as possible. Um, on that link, you'll also find a way that you can request postcards that are pre-addressed. So you can also send them a postcard with information about why you're concerned, why you're urging them to take action as well. And I know that there's um, a ton of us on here tonight. And so if we all just take five minutes after the, at the close of this webinar to make those phone calls, to request those postcards, stickers, there's information about writing a letter to the editor. Um, so if we just take a few minutes at the close of this webinar, we'll be able to make a difference and they'll come to their office the next morning and realize, all right, we just got 100 new phone calls in last night from folks who are really concerned about this issue. What can we do? And finally, I'd encourage you to talk to your friends, your family, your coworkers about what you learned tonight um, and share this information. Word of mouth is a great way to tell people. Social media, after you make your phone calls tonight, text your family, text your rafting buddies, your fishing buddies, whoever it may be, and tell them, hey, this is an important issue to me. Can you take five minutes? Can you make a phone call? Can you send an email tonight? So there's lots of ways to get involved. Um, and I, yeah, I'm super excited um, that we have this webinar. A reminder that this is just the first um, in a series of webinars. And so that we have mostly obviously talked about salmon tonight and in the future we'll be able to do a deeper dive into the various topics that these, uh, these dams revolve around. 
Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Abby, that's inspiring. Uh, and now I'd like to invite um, uh, some folks back on, uh, Alyssa and Helen and Liz and Tim. If you turn your cameras back on, then you will magically rejoin me here. Yay. And uh, would anyone like to um, share any final thoughts? Please feel free. And uh, if I, if I, I'm gonna, so Liz, uh, final thoughts first. <laughs> and I think we're yeah. gonna, I think Tim, I'm gonna uh, call on you last. <laughs> you know, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity in front of us right now. As, as David pointed out, um, we have elected officials who are, recognizing the false choices that we've been listening to, drowning those voices out and listening to those of us who are looking for solutions that recover salmon and maintain the benefits of the river. But we've got to demand action or it's not going to happen. There's too much going on um, and salmon will get left behind unless we raise our voices. Thanks, Liz. Helen, did you have anything you wanted to add? I, I just wanted to say thank you all for um, putting on this excellent webinar, taking the time to um, be here tonight to all the people who attended to the wonderful panel. It's been a really great conversation. Um, and just to you know, sort of emphasize what Liz said, I, we're at a really pivotal moment in time. Um, as David said, you know, this has been decades and decades of foundational work that's been built by armies of people before us, but we are at a time where the tide is changing and um, everyone needs to get involved now to really push this through. So thank you for keeping, keeping this on the radar of our public. Yes, Thanks, thank Helen. you to everybody who's here. I see some familiar face or familiar names in the chat. Hello, so happy you're here. Um, Waikanish are sacred to the Columbia River people. Salmon are sacred to us and we have an obligation to do everything that we can to ensure that they survive for the generation right now and for future generations. So thank you to everyone for all of your work. All of the little actions that we're doing matter. The things that we are doing today, the five minutes you spend after this um, call to, to send an email or to contact somebody to get involved, it matters. It's the totality of all of our actions that will ensure that there's a future for salmon. So thank you for all that you do. Thank you for being here with us. Stay connected. Um, we look forward to you coming back and learning more and talk to your people about this. Talk to your friends and family, get them involved. Um, and again, we will see you as we work through this process. Um, I have a lot of hope uh, you know, I think everyone, everyone is saying this is the time, and I, I agree with that. This is the time, um, and we, we can make a difference, and we will. Uh, thank you again to, all, to the, uh, the panelists and Alyssa, the host. Uh, really appreciative of everyone who logged in to share some time uh, this evening. Uh, thank you for your commitment to your community, to good fish habitat. Uh, and also your commitment to take action, to take action on uh, protecting this resource that's important to us. Um, keep up the good work, never relent. You know, find out what it is, what actions you can take. This is, this is gonna be um, work that we probably carry with us the rest of our life and it's worth doing. So you know, thank you for your commitment to that. Uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your evening and we look forward to the remainder of the uh, um, dinner hours and the rest of this series uh, to learn more about what we can do to protect our community. Thank you and uh, appreciate you being on and uh, good night. Thanks everybody.